Great. Well, welcome again, everyone. Um, again, I want to kind of go over the agenda for today's session. Um, we are going to have our four trainers in attendance at out an instructor teaching demo. Um, as I mentioned before, they may ask uh, for questions, things like that, um, but that's going to be held until the end. Um, in addition, we're going to have two of our trainers acting as the trainers while some are acting out um, giving the actual demo. They may approach um, serving in that role a little bit differently, um, but that's to be expected. That happens um, during the, the um, live demos. Um, but we're going to start with introductions of our four trainers. Um, and then we're going to divide it up into two segments, each lasting about 20 minutes. So for the first segment, um, Jake will be serving in the role as a trainer and Sarah and Hal will be giving demos. And then for the second segment, Sarah will be serving in the role as a trainer and Jake and Samantha will be giving the demos. Um, for both 20 minute segments, each demo is going to last about five minutes, um, followed by five minutes of feedback. Again, the feedback is going to be provided by the trainers. Everyone that's just here in attendance observing today does not need to provide feedback. Um, but at the end, again, we will have about 10 minutes uh, for questions. So you can add those to line 83 of the Etherpad if you need to. So I am going to stop sharing my screen. And I can turn it over to you all to get started. All right. Um, hi, folks. I'm Jake. Um, just to begin with, this is a carpentry teaching demonstration. So if that's not what you're here for, you're probably in the wrong Zoom. Um, assuming that is what you're here for, I'm going to just do a couple logistics. This is a carpentry's event. It's covered by the carpentry's code of conduct. You're all doing instructor training, so you're familiar with the code of conduct. But just a reminder that any behavior to exclude um, or or harm people is not allowed. And I'll put a link to that code of conduct in the chat in case you wanna take a look at it. Um, so our plan today is to do a teaching demonstration. We're gonna go around and do a quick round of introductions. Um, then I'm gonna go down in an order I have here, uh, just so there's no surprises. Sarah, you'll be going first um, and uh, and you'll do your five minutes. I'll have a timer on my phone. I'll stop you after five minutes. I'll do my best not to interrupt you in the middle of a sentence, but I might end up doing that. Um, sorry about that. And uh, then we'll do feedback. The way feedback is gonna work is while the person is doing their demo, uh, the rest of us should be taking notes in that same two by two matrix that you've been doing in instructor training. So we've got content and delivery, we've got something that worked well and something that could use improvement. Um, for your own purposes, or if you would like in the etherpad, you can write down something in all four cells. But when we're actually giving the feedback out loud, I want you to just choose one thing to say just for the purposes of time. The person who gave the demo will give themselves feedback first then everyone else will give feedback and I will go last. If we're really short on time, I might ask you to just put your feedback in the chat or the etherpad um, instead of saying it out loud, but that's the process we're aiming for. Um, so why don't we go around quickly with introductions. We'll just say our name, pronouns if you would like, and where um, you're located in the world. So my name is Jake, any pronouns are fine. And I live in uh, Hamilton, Ontario, which is in Canada. I work at McMaster University. Uh, Sarah, do you want to go next? Sure. Hi, Sarah Stevens, pronouns she, her, hers. And I'm in Madison, Wisconsin, and I work for the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Welcome, Sarah. Uh, how? Hi, I'm Hao Yi, pronouns he, him. I work at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, USA. Thank you, Hao. And finally, Samantha. Hi, I'm Samantha Han, Sam. Um, I work for UCL and she, her, hers or they, them. I was fine. Great. All right. Welcome, folks. So before we get started, what questions do we have about the plan? I know I ran through it kind of quickly. Awesome. Okay. Sarah, are you um, ready to share your screen? I think so. Let me go ahead and try it. Can you see my Jupyter notebook window here? Yes. 
Oh, one thing I forgot to mention is for those of us, anyone who's not presenting, just make sure you mute yourself um, so that there isn't background noise in the way. Uh, yes, you look fine. So I will count you in with a three, two, one, go, and then you'll have your five minutes, all right? Okay, uh, three, two, one, start. Hi all, welcome back from the break. Um, we just finished up the section about storing multiple values in a list. And so we learned how to store multiple items. This next section we're gonna be talking about is gonna show us more about how to do the same action on multiple items. So we're gonna be reusing those list structures that we learned before, um, but we're gonna be learning how to apply the same action to different items in the list. Um, as we come back to our Jupyter Notebook here from break, uh, if you have it up, um, hopefully you still have it up, I'm going to go ahead and create a new notebook. So I'm going to click the new drop down menu here, and then I'm going to click Python 3 IPython kernel to get a new notebook. You, we have been working in other notebooks, you might still have some of those up. Go back to your um, main page here and start a new one for this, this section. All right, I'm going to stop here and wait for everyone to give me a green check mark in chat to let me know that you have gotten your Jupyter op notebook open and you're ready to continue. And here's where I would wait until all of the yeses were up and then I would go on. Um, all right, we're back to our Jupyter notebook and we're going to go ahead and get started and learning how to repeat the same actions. And a little reminder, we've been working with this inflammation data set. And in the our, our goal is eventually to be able to make a separate set of graphs for each of the infl inflammation data sets that we have in our data that we got. Um, but right now we need to learn how to do this action on any sort of list, do the same action on many lists, on many items in a list. Um, and so we're gonna do it with a simplified example. And so we're gonna go back to uh, the example of a list that's odds. So I'm gonna type odds equals square bracket one comma three comma five comma seven. And then it's inserted the close bracket for me, but I'm gonna make sure that I close my square brackets as well. And so this is gonna be our example list while we play around with learning how to repeat the actions on multiple items. Okay, and I wanna put this list in my environment, so I'm gonna press shift enter or sh uh, shift return. And now I have access to that odds list. I can double check by typing odds and running it by itself in a cell, doing shift return again. Oh, and I made a typo there. Um, and so I can see that it says name odd is not defined here and it's giving me a name error. Um, and so that's telling me that it doesn't find any object or any variable called odd in the environment. And so I need to fix my typo here because I have an S at the end of this list in the original definition of it. And now if I press shift enter again, I can see that I have my odds list and I can go ahead and work with it. So if we look back at how we've accessed um, lists in the past, we've used indexing. And so we're going to type, we would type print, open parentheses, and then the name of the list. So that's odds in this case, and then square bracket again. And then we would access the list item we want. So if we want the first list item in Python, that's indexed as zero. And so we'd put zero. And so if we were gonna grab all of these items, we might wanna do, we could do the same action over and over again. I'm gonna type print odds square bracket one, and I'll do the same thing, print odds square bracket two, and then print odds square bracket three. And so if I run this, it'll give me individual access to each of the items in the list. And so it's gonna access each item one at a time. The problem with this is it doesn't scale super well. So when we are when we add items to the list, we would have to add another print statement each time. And so that doesn't work well as we make lists that might be more dynamic, we might be adding or removing items from them. We would have to update the specific pieces of our code every time. And we really want to be able to have our code run on any length of list and be able to do any um, the same action on whatever list it's given and not break. And so th this is where using for loops can come in, in, in to practice. So um, in a for loop, we uh, are gonna do the same action on multiple items. And so let's write out our first for loop here. 
um, to go through each of the odds list and print it. And so we're going to write out the syntax and then we're going to talk about it. So we're going to say for num in odds and then a colon here at the end of the line. And then we press enter and you'll notice it indented the second line here for my um, for loop and that's what it's supposed to do. And then I'm going to say print num. All right, Let's talk Sarah, about That's five minutes. Thanks so Thank much. You. Uh, you can stop sharing your screen. So um, quick round of feedback. Sarah, do you want to start? How did that feel? Anything you would do differently? Anything you were very proud of? Um, I I liked getting into starting it. So I think that that worked well. I liked reviewing the, the lists from the last section. Um, I tripped up a little bit when I was transitioning from one piece of code to the other. And so I, I wasn't feeling as comfortable at that point. And I had my words kind of slip up, but hopefully that wasn't too impactful for, for learners, but you can let me know. I'd love feedback on it. Um, okay, thanks so much. Um, just to uh, switch things up a little bit, I'm gonna get Samantha to give uh, one piece of feedback for Sarah. Um, okay, do you want the, the worked well or, or one thing that's- Whichever fun. you prefer, up to um, you. So I really liked the pausing bit to make sure they had the Jupyter lab all open and making use of the emojis for that and then explaining to us um, what you've done and why you've done it. All right, thank you, Samantha. How, do you have a piece of feedback for Sarah? Um, I thought it went really smoothly. I, I got, I think a little bit lost in some of the explanation of lists and then like the the um, the relevant example of like producing multiple data sets from or producing multiple graphs from the data set but also like I'm not familiar with the lesson I haven't gone through like the previous episodes of the lesson and that's just like a conceit of the way that we do teaching demos so I don't know that that's like a like a you know a major thing uh, to consider um yeah I, I think it can go both ways Awesome. Thanks, Ho. All right. For me, um, I thought that went quite well. A couple things that I noticed. One is the perennial problem that we all have, which is I would talk a little slower, um, or at least I would aspire to talk a little slower because I probably wouldn't actually talk slower. Um, and another thing that I noticed is you did a really good job of narrating every single keystroke, which I thought was really great. And the only exception to that was when parentheses auto-completed. And I don't know if that's something that would have come up in an earlier episode that would have already been mentioned, but when you go through the auto-completed parentheses, just mentioning that that's what you're doing, I think uh, would be good. All right, thank you, Sarah. I just realized um, before we move on to the next person that one thing I didn't say right at the beginning is that um, you won't be finding out today whether this is your last demo or whether you're going to be asked to return to do another demo. Um, I just want to remind us all, though, that this is not a high pressure test, that if you are asked to return, it's just because we want to set you up for success and make sure that you can be an effective Carpentries instructor. And so we're providing you with additional opportunities to practice. It doesn't mean that you failed or that we don't think you're going to be a good instructor or anything like that. Now, Sarah, I don't want you to think that I'm saying this because anything went wrong with your demo. I just literally forgot to say it at the beginning. So I apologize for the timing on that. Um, all right. So next up we have how is that right? I think that's right. Um, are you ready to share your screen how? I will test it out. Um, I think I'm actually going to share the whole desktop because there might be some change in windows here. Okay. Uh, is that screen showing up and is my audio coming through? Yep, what I'm looking at right now is our studio. Okay, uh, then I think I'm set. Okay, um, so just a reminder, Sarah and Samantha to do that two by two feedback and I'll set a five minute timer. Three, two, one, go. Okay, well, welcome back. Um, now that we have all learned a little bit about using R for data analysis. Um, I wanna talk about 
a really cool tool that uh, I use a lot in my own work, uh, which is R Markdown. And what I find really neat about R Markdown is it allows me to create um, all kinds of really professional looking outputs um, from within R. So uh, if you're doing your research project um, and you're doing like a data analysis or you're generating uh, a graph of something, um, but you know that you're like also writing a paper or maybe preparing a presentation, you'll be like, you'll want to like copy the statistics or the figure into, you know, a Word document or a PowerPoint. What our markdown will let you do is kind of have all of those pieces together in a single document so that your code and your like slide formatting uh, can all be uh, a single entity. Uh, and that makes it um, kind of really convenient so that as you like update your code, you don't have to keep on like copy pasting figures and things like that. Um, and it also is nice for reproducibility practices because you can share your R Markdown document, uh, which will have like your complete analysis and the description of it. Okay, so how do we begin? Um, first up, uh, we want to check that we're still in the same project directory. So what we'll want to see is in this files pane in the bottom right, uh, that we still have this data folder, which contains the data set that we have been working with previously. Uh, so this is um, this agricultural data set. And what we're going to do is we're going to start by making a new R Markdown document. And the way that we are going to do this uh, is within R Studio. Um, if we go to this button here at the top left for a new document, we can click it. Um, and then there should be an option here for R Markdown, which is built into R Studio already, so we don't need to install anything else. And there are a number of options here. We're going to actually start with an empty document so we can talk through kind of all the pieces of how an R Markdown document is put together. So we're going to click this button in the bottom left here, which is to create empty document. Okay. And our window has changed. We now see uh, an editor pane, which has uh, basically an empty document. Um, and you should see uh, some buttons here that may look a little different from you know, what we saw previously when we were working with our scripts. So we want to make sure that we have like these like indicators for knit uh, on save and knit. That gives us a clue that we're working in our markdown document. OK. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to set up a header that contains some basic metadata about our document. Uh, and the header is written in this very specific format um, where it starts with three hyphens on a single line, and then it ends with uh, three hyphens. And so this is like the designation that this is the header block of this R Markdown document. And there are a few fields that uh, we want to make sure to include. Uh, what is absolutely required is this field called output. So we're going to go ahead and type that in. And then the syntax is particular. So we want to make sure that we have a colon and a space. Um, and then there's a specific uh, specific types of outputs that are recognized in our markdown. Uh, we're going to start with one of the basic ones, which is an, an HTML document. So that will be HTML underscore document. And you will want this all in lowercase. So that is required uh, for an R Markdown document. Um, and then we can also add in other fields that will be useful, like the title and an author. But what we want to do, what I want to do right now is just make sure this is this is all working correctly and that, that it knits properly on your computer. Uh, so what we'll want to do is save this R Markdown document so we can click the save icon or your keyboard shortcut for save. So we can save this in our project folder as something like my report. And then we will want to click this knit button and see if this magic happens. OK. And so that happened really quickly. So let me let me kind of like do that again in case you missed it. So. Uh, this knit button here in the top menu of the R Markdown editor, uh, we can click it. And that will 
take our R markdown document and go through all of the steps that are involved in generating an output. Um, right, that's then... that's five minutes. How? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, you can stop sharing your screen. So let's start with you. Um, how did you feel like that went? Is there anything you would have done differently? Is there anything you're very proud of? I I like went back and forth on how much introduction to cover um, for for like the motivation for this episode. Um, in some ways, like getting into the code is nicer. In other ways, like I feel like there are some like really useful explanations that kind of I wanted to have to tie the content of the episode back in with what I think like participants will be there in the workshop for. And I think that is that 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 is helpful. So I, uh, you know, I might like get some feedback and might adjust that a little bit. Part of that is also like feeling the stress of having only five minutes for the teaching demo and like wanting to get into the the, the coding a little bit. Um I realized when I was uh, like doing the check on the working directory, I like clicked through some stuff without talking about it. Um, so, so that maybe was like not super ideal, but also like probably maybe not necessary to talk through since that is like, it's just a check where we don't want, we don't actually need learners to go through and like click those things. Um, I did make some changes from, from the episode because I wanted to get into like kind of coding a little bit faster and I wanted to actually show the like output generation faster. Um, so that's, that's like my little bit of like personalization there um, to not type in all the fields of the header um, and to click the knit button sooner and save the document. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I feel okay with that choice. All right. Thanks, Hal. Uh, Sarah, do you have a piece of feedback for Hal? Yeah, I really liked how you repeated the knitting piece because I know that like clicking and stuff happens for learners really fast. And so um, I really enjoyed that you were like, oh, this happens really fast. I'm going to repeat it to give them a second chance to see it. So that was really cool to see. Thanks, Sarah. Samantha. Um. Yeah, um, what bit to go with? Um, no, I really like the kind of the introduction to, to Markdown and why you use it. Um, yeah. <laughs> so right. Thank you, Sarah. Um, for my feedback, the thing that I did notice is something that you mentioned yourself was the clicking without saying every single thing that you click which I think is worth, even if it's not the point of the lesson, I think if you are doing it in front of learners, then you want to do it in a way that is not going to be baffling over or overwhelming to them. So even if it's not the point, I would still make a point of, of clicking each thing um, would be my main, of, of narrating each thing that you click um, would be my main feedback about that. But other than that, I thought it went really well. Um, I also liked the knitting, the knitting sooner. I thought that was a good change. Um, all right, so now I'm gonna step down as fake trainer and Sarah's gonna step into this role so that I can give a demo. All right, um, and I think from here on out, we're gonna do only nonverbal feedback in the etherpad and chat, um, just to make sure we have enough time to get through this session. Um, but we'll still get feedback from the person who just presented and I'll give um, some feedback non-verbally non-verb or as well. Um, all right, I think Jake is up next. Jake, would you like to share your screen? Sure. Um, just make sure I'm sharing the right window here. So we um, see your open refine see... window with the I mean, 790 rows. Perfect. And oh. how is the font size? Um, it's a little bit small. It could probably be a little bit bigger if you want to go up a couple steps. Is that better or another one? I, uh, I'd go up one more maybe. Okay. All right. Um, I have my timer set up on my phone and whenever you're ready to start teaching, go take a deep breath and get everything set up. And whenever you start teaching, I'll start my timer. Great. Okay. 
So we are talking about um, working with data in OpenRefine. We've already installed and opened OpenRefine and imported a data set into OpenRefine. And now we're just going to talk a little bit about um, some of the ways that we can explore and clean up the data in OpenRefine. OpenRefine is a tool for exactly this, for doing cleaning actions and a little bit of exploration on data sets that are kind of too big to do that just manually. Um, one of the most useful features of OpenRefine for doing this is called facets. Data faceting is a process of exploring data where you basically group rows in the data by values that appear in a column. This allows you to look at the properties of those values and make changes to a bunch of rows all at once that are grouped on those values, things like that. We're gonna start by looking at text columns and we're gonna make what's called a text facet. Uh, so we're going to look at the column scientific name that appears to be the third column here. Uh, we start by clicking on the down arrow next to scientific name. That makes a menu appear with a bunch of options. The first option is facet. When I hover over it, a submenu appears with a bunch of kinds of facets, and I'm choosing the top one here, text facet. When I click that, a box appears in my left-hand column here. We can see the box says 14 choices. That means there are 14 different unique values in this column. Um, and uh, we can see a number next to each value that's a little bit grayed out. And that represents the number of times that value appears in this data set in this column. We can sort, it's by default alphabetically sorted by name. We can also sort by count by clicking on the word count here at the top of this box. When I click there, the most common value appears at the top, that's 240 values. And I can scroll to the bottom and there's a handful that are one value each. And those should be alphabetical within the number. Um, as far as I know, there isn't a way to reverse the order, like to sort smallest to highest, you just have to scroll to the bottom. All right. Now, if we look at these, I'm going to go back to sorting by name. So I click on the name value here. If we look at these, there are probably some things that jump out at us right away as things that are probably data entry problems. The first thing I'm noticing is that the top two values here are indented relative to the rest of the values. And what that probably means is that there is a space that was typed almost certainly by accident before the name of the value. And when I hover over it and you see that it becomes underlined, you can see that the underline extends beyond the first letter Whereas if I underline down on this third value, it doesn't. So that means there is, that's called a leading space when there's a space before the first value. The other thing that I'm noticing that is a bit odd is that these top two values look like they're identical. They're spelled the same. Um, they each occur once, but identical values should not appear twice in this facet. The whole point of the facet is that it groups identical things. So there must be something different about them. So looking more closely, what I notice is that this gray number one is offset a little bit compared to the one above it. And when I hover my mouse over this value, I see that the underline extends beyond the last letter of the second word. What that means is that there is a trailing space or a space at the end of the word. Also, almost certainly a data entry error, not a meaningful distinction. Looking down at these next three, I again see things that look to me like they are misspellings of the uh, of this third one, Amospermophilus herisii. This one is missing an I. This one is both missing an I and has a misspelling at the end of Amospermophilus here, and they both occur once. As a rule, if something only occurs once in your data set, you want to be a little bit suspicious. It might, in fact, be unique, um, but it might be a typo. And if it's similar to something that occurs more than once, then you want to make sure that it's not a typo. 
One thing that you may have noticed as I move my mice, my mouse around is that the... there's your five minutes. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you. Uh, you can go ahead and stop your screen share now. How did it feel? What feedback do you have for yourself? Um, I feel like I was talking really fast and yet didn't actually get to the like doing things part of the lesson. Um, but I think that that maybe is just how a five minute demo goes. Um, I would have liked to stop for questions. Like, I feel like I was just saying information, saying information, saying information. And in an actual teaching situation, I probably would have stopped for feedback, stopped for questions, um, which I didn't do here. So sure, yeah, those, that's my feedback for myself. Yeah, it's only five minutes. So oftentimes you aren't going to get very far in the lesson. And if you did, it would might mean you were going too fast in your teaching demo as well. And so it's totally understandable that you didn't get to like the core of this episode. Um, and then the other stopping for questions. If if you do a teaching demo in the future, you can stop and ask for questions. I would then say, oh, I would wait here for so many seconds or whatever to um, give people an idea of how you would do that if you go forward. Um, so everyone else, please give feedback for Jake in the Etherpad and or in chat. Um, I'm going to go through my feedback uh, here on that presentation and content, uh, things to improve, things that worked well, um, Matrix. I thought your speed was pretty good. I think there was an internet hiccup on my end that like made it fast and slow. And so sometimes it sounded like you were speaking weirdly slow and sometimes it like would speed up a little bit after that. I think that was my side. I thought your speaking speed was pretty good. Um, if, if it was a little on the fast side, maybe, but for the most part, I think it was very understandable. Um, I did notice that um, that clicking to do the facet um, can happen really fast for learners. And I might pause for just a second longer. You um, did a great job of pausing as you did the menu, but then when you clicked it, it disappeared. And I've learned the hard way that learners that that just once the screen changes, they're like, Sarah, what, what did you just click? And so I would say, wait just a little longer on that um, before you click the, the facet button at the end and the screen changes there. And then um, I thought you had a great review of what you covered at the beginning. That was really nice to see how the uh, beginning related to what you just covered in the previous episode and um, set the stage for the data cleaning purpose of this lesson. Um, I might add a little to that that purpose in that when you were talking about facets, it's sort of an abstract concept until you've seen it. So it might be good to include an example of when you would use a facet in data cleaning at the beginning. Maybe it's the example that's coming up. Maybe it's a different example. Um, but I think that might set people up for understanding what a facet is a little bit better at that point. Okay, thank you, Jake. Uh, we're gonna go on to Samantha next. Yeah, thank you. I'm just gonna share the white screen. All right, we see your Unix shell terminal um, in the teaching folder, it looks like to me. Yeah, fabulous. Is the text big enough for everybody? I would go a step or two bigger on that one too. It's control or command I plus. Tweet usually. This. I had my standard setup, but I was worried it was actually slightly too big. And um, it is sometimes I was worried it would. It tough balance because you don't want too much line wrapping but um usually in in a real workshop i would probably ask the learners to tell me if it was too big and then when they don't tell me i would ask the helpers in the room because they will definitely tell you if no one else does um just be sure that looks great um Fabulous. okay so this right. is my standard teaching nice um, whenever you're ready, take a breath. And when you start teaching, I'll start my timer. Okay, so um, in this next section, we're going to build on what we've done before. So, so far today, we've um, been introduced to the Unix shell. And we've talked a little bit about how we um, interact with it. Uh, we've spoken specifically about the importance of spaces and case sensitivity. And we've kind of looked at how we can move around the structure. Now, for now, I've just realized I'm not quite in the right place. So I'm actually going to move to my desktop. 
and I'm going to move into the directory where I've got my shell lesson data. And you can see here that I'm, I'm in my shell lesson data directory, it shows on my left hand side. But if I want to check, I can use the command pwd and that's going to tell me where I am. So I'm in users, I'm in my teaching desktop, my teaching account, I'm on the desktop and I'm in my directory shell lesson data. So this is, um, I'm on a Mac, um, so I'm using Bash within the Mac. And if you're using Bash within the Mac or a Linux user, you'll see it in this form. If you're on Windows, the slashes may go the opposite way. Okay, um, so, so just be aware of that, that it may look slightly different depending on what operating system you're looking at. So I'm in my shell lesson data directory, and I want to specifically look at what is in my exercise data folder and specifically my writing directory. So I can move directly into um, the subdirectory of another directory. Actually, if I just kind of have a look at what's here for a second, you can see that I've got a number of directories. So I'm going to go into exercise data and I'm going to go into writing. So I'm going to CD, so I'm going to change my directory to exercise data. And within that, sorry, just a second. Um, within this directory, I know I have a directory called writing. So I can see now that just the left of my prompt, it says that I'm in writing. And if I have a look at what's in here, I guess I'm going to do an ls minus f. I'm just going to list my files in my directory. And I've got two text files here. Okay, I've got littlewomen.txt and I have a few. And in here now, because this is where I'm going to keep all the writing for my project, I'm going to create a new directory and I'm going to call this thesis. And this is where I'm going to start writing up all the work for my analysis that we're going to do and that Nell is going to do. So I'm going to create a new directory and I'm going to use the command mkdir, or I think it is kind of quite nicely make directory. It, it kind of looked uh, um, kind of almost does what it says on the tin a little bit. And I'm going to call this thesis. Um, I'm going to create this with a capital T. And like most commands, it executes quietly. Okay. Ooh. Actually, I've, I've made that slightly wrong. I've made it with a capital T and I was going to make it with a little T. But we can look at how we can change that later on. Okay. So it, it quietly does its thing. And if I want to check that it is here, I can use the LS minus F again. And I can see that I have this directory thesis. And I know it's a directory because I have this, this slash for in it. So this is how I'm going to. If you remember, this is how we kind of differentiate between our, our files and our directories. So now I have this and it's here. Um, I can have a look and see if there's anything in it. So say I had a directory before and I wasn't sure I could see if there was anything in it. I'm not expecting there to be anything in it because I've just made it, but let's, let's have a look. So I can have a look and see. And there's nothing there, so it hasn't returned anything. So it is an empty directory. In addition to making a single directory, I can make multiple directories at once. So I'm going to use the make directory command again. I'm going to use the P flag, because I'm going to create multiple directories this time. And I'm going to create them in a slightly different place. So can I remember how we would kind of reference the directory above where I am? Bong. All right. Uh, you can go ahead and stop your screen share. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and uh, what feedback do you have for yourself? How did it feel? Uh, very awkward because I'm going to do everything on a single MacBook screen and I, I had issues with that. I couldn't actually see what I was typing because I had your faces down the right hand side. Um, so it just felt very, 
a, a bit awkward and clunky because my estate for teaching wasn't set up quite so nicely, mostly. Um, and to be honest, they don't care whether I've made your thesis with a capital T or not, um, because they're never going to see the notes. So it doesn't really matter. So I didn't need to mention that. It was just a more to myself of, oh, it's, you know, I've done that wrong. So. I will say um, on real estate, it is hard because teaching requires often a lot of windows to have up. Um, sometimes what I do is I keep a separate device if I don't have a very big screen that I have my notes on or the lesson on. I often pull that up on my iPad, particularly in person. When I teach remotely, I actually have a really big screen, so luckily that works. But in person, I always like to have a separate screen, usually because projectors only let you share your whole screen as well. So um, other instructors also like to print out the notes, and so that can be another option if you uh, need to have those. I think one of the issues was having our faces, so maybe some screen rearrangement and if you'd had time for that it would have been a little I, bit easier so usually there are two screens I have notes on one this on the other if I'm at home I normally have a second device I'm not in my normal room for teaching either so I have nowhere to put a second device currently so this afternoon is very um unusual but also kind of interesting in that respect yeah, it's um, maybe also a little bit of understanding what the learners might be going through, because mm. many of them might not also have real estate to put their all the different windows up when they're teaching. And so I actually often send advice ahead of time about how learners can arrange their screens to um, help them prepare in advance for managing the Zoom window and the tool that they're teaching and the Etherpad and all of those pieces as well. Um, on the thesis note, um, you mentioned about your, your uh, directory and that they didn't really care. It might actually be a good opportunity to talk about that the Unix shell does care about whether it's capitalized or not. Um, as it, I, it, like For you, it I felt like a mistake, but um, maybe it was a good opportunity to be like, thesis with an upper T is different from thesis with a lowercase t and um, something to watch out for for them as well. I thought about that. I know, but it, it comes up very soon. Oh, it's in the lesson later. Okay, that's yeah, a good reason to wait later. as well. Yeah. yeah. All right. Please give feedback for Samantha in chat or in the Etherpad. I'll go through my feedback um, really quickly here. Um, I like that you covered the differences between OS and the slashes and how you, they see that because that's really helpful to be able to articulate what is going to look different between Windows and Mac Unix um, wind screens. And we try and choose tools that are going to be as consistent, as consistent as possible, but sometimes they aren't. And so being aware of those as an instructor can be really helpful because learners will sometimes catch like feel like something's going wrong when anything looks different on their screen. Um, on the so this is a little bit of the later section in the lesson i might ask them to remind me how to change directories and how to get to the folder that i uh, we're going to just to give a chance to kind of call back to the previous episode where they learned cd and pwd um, i often ask them to type that in chat or say that out loud um I thought your speed was really great and you actually paused a bit after some of your statements, which is really helpful for learners to kind of um, like bring into their minds the thing that you just said. And so um, I, I liked your spe speaking speed very well. Um, you know, make the direct the make directory command might be a great opportunity to talk about that directories are the same as folders. Um, oftentimes people are coming in with that folders in their mind as the definition. And so making that connection that folders and directories are the same. I always have to do that because I use the words interchangeably and you are actually very consistent about calling them directories. Um, I think it still might be useful for connecting those learners who may think of it as a, a folder to mention that, that connection. Okay, thank you all for your teaching demos. Um, it was wonderful to meet you all. And uh, you'll get an email afterwards about if um, you need to do the teaching demo again, or if this was the last teaching demo you had to do for checkout requirements. If this is the last thing you need to do for checkout, um, you should get an email in the next week or so saying you're certified. If you think you've completed all the requirements and you don't see that email, it's worth checking in Amy or sending an email to instructor.training at carpentries.org to check in on it. Um, it was wonderful to meet you all. Welcome to the Carpentries community. And I hope to see you around and teach with you in future sessions. I'll stick around in case you have any questions after the demo about checkout or anything in the Carpentries. Um, but otherwise, it was wonderful to see you all. And thanks for attending this teaching demo.
Thanks, everyone, so much. Um, a round of applause for all of our actors. Oh, no, people are leaving. <laughs> Don't really leave. Don't really leave. <laughs> Don't really it's not actually leave. over. <laughs> I, I I left several notes that we were going to have some time for questions and discussion. Um, there haven't been any added to the ether pad, um, but I, again, we wanted to have plenty of space for those that were observing um, everyone. Uh, if you had any questions um, about what you were observing at all, and I'll pause there. I wasn't really ready for the end, so I was like, oh, I have to give my closing announcements. <laughs> um, while people think of questions, please put questions in the chat um, about how the teaching demo works, about what you saw from us teaching. But um, while you think about questions, I will just have a little reflection on the process as someone doing the teaching demo. Um, I do teaching demos. I host them all the time as a trainer and I teach all the time. It shocked me how much more nervous I was doing this as a performance for you and for a real teaching demo than I normally would be. Um, I I kind of was surprised um, at, that it upped my nerves in a way that even teaching doesn't. I always thought it was maybe authentic for what I normally feel like when I teach, but I was actually more nervous than I thought I was going to be. Yeah, same. Yeah, I would echo that too, that felt weirdly horrible actually <laughs> <laughs> well I also I went out of the I went out of my way to teach a lesson that I don't normally teach so it was definitely um more uncomfortable for that reason uh, there's a question in the chat Kaylee is asking how much does talking speed count towards passing or needing to redo especially given the short demo period um, for me personally, if count if talking speed is the only real um, sort of improvement feedback that I have for someone, that will probably not make me ask them to redo it. But every um, every facilitator makes their own decisions. I will add my perspective on that one as well. In that, I only would ask you to repeat your teaching demo for speed if it completely impacted our ability to understand what you were teaching, right? A little too fast. It's an example. I might give you feedback and give you the tools that I use to try and teach a little bit slower or give you some suggestions, um, but I would still probably pass you if it was Un not possible for the audience to understand what you were saying and follow along because uh, it went so fast, then I might ask you to practice again because it's a good opportunity to try and implement that feedback that you got and see if you can slow it down a little bit. Does that help, Kaylee? Any other trainers want to add their, their perspectives? I would say that it, it also comes with experience, that slowing down a little bit. And it's always a nervous thing. So I know I'm going to start every session probably slightly too fast and then I will consciously slow myself down um but it's taken a long time to kind of be at that point of really kind of consciously um slowing down and and, and pausing and, and kind of giving it and sometimes you will feel that it's a little bit too slow but it's also what your learners need and you'll learn also to read your, your learners and, and understand and get that that place right. To jump off of Jake's point, like I don't think talking speed alone is ever like usually an issue, but when it is an issue, it is like talking speed and trying to like get through sections of the code quickly um, because of the like feeling like you're not covering the, like the material fast enough. And when it starts to become like, okay, I'm just like typing this code in and like, you know, showing the result and not talking about it uh, or not pausing, those kinds of things then then like become an issue. But like, I, I think we generally understand that like people talk at different speeds. We have there is a question. question in the chat, but before we get to it, I just want to add on to that and say that even in a demo where you only have five minutes, it's still better to cover less and and not sacrifice the quality of the demo um okay next question in the chat do you have a process for deciding whether to start with an introduction versus jump right in and again like it's it's going to be very individual i would say your introduction should be less than 30 seconds 
I also tell people you're not introducing the workshop in your teaching demo. So you don't need to tell people where the bathrooms are. You don't need to tell them the expectations that you would at the beginning of the workshop, the code of conduct, et cetera. You're introducing the episode of the lesson that you're working on. So I think Jake made a great example. 30 seconds is a good amount of intro to, to talk through for an episode, but you're not introducing the whole workshop. So you don't have to worry about um, that piece. You can start as if you'd already done that. The point of that introduction is mostly, for me anyway, to let the facilitator know what has already been covered so that you're not getting feedback of you didn't cover something that already was covered. That, for me, is the main purpose of the introduction. So when I said we've already opened it, we've already imported the data so that Sarah doesn't have to say, well, you didn't talk about how the data got there, you know? So that's that's the purpose of the introduction in a teaching demo. I will agree and also say it is sometimes to, nice to set the stage for the learners to kind of remind them the things that they've just covered and set the stage of what they're covering as well. But I think those details that Jake mentioned of like, I've already done these three things, that that's definitely um, helpful for us not to have to give you feedback on it as well. I'd also say that all the kinds of the lessons have a narrative. So kind of when you you're doing this you're kind of going that oh so the next stage so so far we've done this and the next stage is this so we're going to look at how we do that and the next bit is this so there's always kind of the that bit all the way through anyway like you're always kind of foregrounding and explaining how it ties together anyway so just having that little bit of you know oh well we, we've seen this so now we're going to look at how because we're going to do this um and, and yeah, it's it's kind of, they're short little bits, but they're really useful linking bits that when you're actually delivering training, help kind of people understand and give them something to hang on to of why they're doing something and why it's really important. There's a question from Oscar in the chat. When you're called back, uh, when you repeat a teaching demo, uh, can you present the same lesson or are you expected to do a different lesson? Um, the lesson or episode of the lesson that you choose is up to you for all of your teaching demos. So if you want to do the same one again, you're very much welcome to. If you want to try a different section, then you're welcome to as well. As Hao said, we don't check. We don't even know it, whether you've done the teaching demo multiple times or not or what you've taught in the different teaching demos. And so um, it, it doesn't matter to us. And we want whatever you're most comfortable with for, for teaching for your teaching demo. I do just want to add to that. I think there's a balancing act here. So if familiarity with the lesson um, is an issue, then yeah, it makes sense to stick with the same lesson. But we don't want you present like preparing a clean, timed five minute presentation. So if you're doing the same lesson again, what what we don't want to see is like you do five minutes and then you stop and then you're like, all right, I'm done. I'm ready for my feedback now. Like we want you familiar enough with the lesson to be able to teach it but to teach it as if you're teaching it to a real class and to be prepared to go until the um, the facilitator says stop and to maybe not have a perfect script memorized or anything like that. Plus one on what, just Jake, what Jake just said, because it's, I think with the recent changes to teaching demos, um, it's been a little bit more common pe for people to really prepare five minutes and maybe over prepare that five minutes. Um, but it's hard to prepare for three and a half hours the same way you would prepare for five minutes. And so as an instructor, often we have to learn to be flexible to the, both the classroom we're in, but also with how the lessons are are going. Um, and so you, you can prepare and you should prepare to teach in, adequately, um, but you probably won't be reading off a script and that five minutes is is the same the same is true for that five minutes and so we don't want you I, I've seen people do teaching demos where they went a little faster than they expected and they only prepared five minutes so that when they got to the end they kind of didn't know what to do next and so you want to prepare in a way that's kind of more authentic to how you would have prepared for the whole lesson as Jake mentioned and be actually ready to go on if you need to. We are much more interested in seeing you adhere to the carpentry's teaching principles and um, doing things like using inclusive language, narrating your actions, stuff like that, than we are in how, like, we want you to stick to the lesson, but if you don't stick completely perfectly to the lesson, um, then we, we care about that a lot less than we care about the, the underlying principles of how we do teaching here. 
Um, I just want to say we have just a few minutes left. Um, so for folks that are here again for instructor checkout, um, you'll need to um, add to the any database that you attended today if you're here for your Get Involved step. Um, I know a lot of people are interested in being here today that could not be. So again, having this recording, um, we'll be making this available so others can um, also observe uh, that could not be uh, could not be here. And so um, I will be informing um, the community uh, when this is available and has subtitles added. Um, but again, wanted to give a big round of applause for, for all of our actors. You all did, um, an amazing job. Um, but, uh, I'm, um, I'm going to stop the recording.